to cure to their pain unless they're in pain to start off with. I mean, Ran imagines that the Grail is the cup of Lucifer, that um, Lucifer, the light bearer, is thrown out of heaven and longs to return to heaven, longs to return to that state of grace and is trapped in hell and that the only way out of hell is to be forgiven, to regain whatever that spiritual power was, whatever it was that one lost, that lost balance to make it back into paradise. But generally, like Lucifer or the devil or anyone else, one has to sort of watch out for the people who are looking for the cup because they're generally not the sweetest people in the world. Well, secret glory is annoying. It's not complete from the point of view that the quest isn't over. How could it ever really be over? It raises more questions than it answers. I mean, technically, it's not quite complete for sure because it's still got its rough edges. And it's just the tippy tip tip of the iceberg. We cut together as much as we could. But Paul the Dam, for instance, talked for two days when we interviewed him. You know, we include um, maybe half an hour of material from him. But even the stuff we picked up on is much more dense than what we've had time to include. And we simply ran out of money. We couldn't track down everyone involved. There are still people from the Race and Settlement Department, from the Archaeological Department of the SS that I would really like to talk to. They're still living witnesses. They're, for instance, the two children who were the last ones to see Ran alive and who found the body in the snow the next year, they're alive somewhere. There's different people. Um, there's the matter of the polar expeditions. There's sections of their work which remain classified to this day, and I would like to know what they were doing. I still don't know exactly what those guys were up to. And you have a whole ship like the Schwabenland, which with an entire expedition of people, a crew of people, a bunch of SS men, it's really expensive to get together something that big and to send it all the way to the North Pole. There was a, there was a reason for that. There would be some, they would have had a mission. They, you know, no one would spend that amount of money on something unless there was some kind of actual hard end result. And I simply don't have the answers to all of it. I don't know what they were up to. A lot of the time we get cover stories. I mean, think of it in terms of, say, um, a, a metaphor might be the Roswell incident out here in America. Um, a lot of people think that the, um, the Roswell crash was a cover story or that the American military used flying saucers to cover up their spying operation on Russia, that maybe they were spying on Russia's nuclear power program and they used flying saucers as a convenient excuse to cover for it. Now, I think a lot of the time we've got the cover story. We haven't got the original story. We hear about, say, the hollow earth or a lost Aryan homeland somewhere hidden beneath the ice mantle, the quest for the Holy Grail, etc., etc. Now, I'm pretty sure that those things aren't always the actual reasons the Nazis had. I'm sure that they often had genuine practical reasons for doing what they were doing, but they told people at the time that we were looking for the hollow earth, or they came up with some ridiculous story, like it's a piece of a flying saucer or something, to cover up the real thing. And I think all too often what we've got is we've got the disinformation that the SS might have put out at the time in 1936, but we haven't always got the full story of what they were really doing. Personally, I have no idea what happened to Otto. I don't know if that's Otto's body in the grave, and if it is Otto's body in the grave, I don't know why he died. I don't know who killed him, whether he committed suicide, or, what it, or why it was that Otto went from being a nobody into being one of the most powerful men in the SS, into being, and then suddenly going back into being a nobody again, and then being exterminated as fast as he did. It's like he did something which won him um, tremendous respect within the ranks of the Third Reich, and he did something else which caused him to fall from power. And I don't really know what. It's, it's tempting to believe that it was the, the, di the dig in the south of France and the actual discovery of the great Watsit in the first place that got him into Himmler's good books. But then I think he got his hand caught in the cookie jar somehow, that he did something else which caused him to fall from favor. And I don't really know what that was. He also traveled far more widely than we've had time to say in the documentary. Fortunately, if Otto did die in, the ni in 939, he, he, he meant he died young. He died at around 34, not much older than Christ. But um, in the meantime, he'd spent a lot of time in Spain, which we never mentioned in the documentary, in Franco's Spain. He also spent a lot of time in Italy under Mussolini, and we had no time to mention this either. But it's also my Italian and my Spanish simply weren't good enough to ask the same questions. And I have not yet followed his trail north to Iceland, although I'm hoping that in another month or so I'll be able to finally do that. The procedure each time is the same, to follow the route as an SS man, he had to have his plans approved most of the time. And there's whole letters remaining in the Bundes archive where he gets permission to visit various towns, just lists of towns and places. Most of these places are very remote. 
and you go to a remote place in the middle of Iceland, the Pyrenees, in the middle of the back of beyond, and most people remember the SS if they're still alive. And you say, well, who was here 70 years ago in the town? You find the oldest people, and then you ask, um, do you remember, you know, in 1938, when the SS came to your village? And usually they do, because you don't forget something like that. Very often it's the, um, the only time that the Nazis might have been there during the war. And generally the old people do recall. And there's a lot of place stages on the journey which I haven't been to yet. To be honest, I haven't even been to Otto's favorite place, which is in, is, is in Bursen in the Tyrolean Alps. But it's so high up, he said it was the hardest climb. He was a prodigious climber. It's a place called the Rose Garden which is a mountain of rose quartz, really high up at the top of the, of basically in the Tyrolean Alps. And I would so love to see that, particularly at sunrise or sunset, that spire of rose quartz in the middle of nowhere, it's out there. And so many of the stages in his journey. Also, Ron um, wrote three books, but only two of them are available. We translated his second book into English. Um, we, uh, there, there hasn't been an English copy before, but we've laboriously translated the whole thing, and some other guy translated the first book into English. But no copy of the third book exists. It was never published. The manuscript is missing. Um, all his diaries are missing after 36. He, his body turned up in 39, three years later. The last diary runs out at the Arctic Circle. We don't know what happened between the Arctic Circle and really the, the, the death of Ram, his body being found in the snow on the Kufstein. There's a period of about three years which is sort of missing, where all the records are gone. Now, I assume that either his mother destroyed the records on purpose or the SS confiscated them. But there's a whole manuscript missing in there, an entire book, which um, was meant to be the third part of his, of his saga, of his big thesis. And without the third book of Ram, we don't really know what he was on about. We, well, I haven't yet fully understood what it was he was trying to say. So from that point of view, it's, um, it remains a little oblique incomplete.